uh, going through the cycle of a week. What do we need throughout our week to uh, just keep going? These are Psalms of David. How do we endure during hard times? How do we deal with, uh, with you know, what are the things that we can do to cope with hard times, and how do we get through those and, and still be praising the Lord at the end of it all? And uh, we're going to look a little bit today at another Psalm of the Morning. I love these Psalms because they, they're introduced well. They're given titles that I don't have to come up with a title for the sermon. Uh, the title for the sermon is right at the top there. It's, it's in the original text. It may not be, I don't know, call, call it inspired. It's in our Bible, and it was in the original text. It, it is, lead me in the way of righteousness, or lead me into righteousness. And, uh, and I think that's a great way to pray in the morning, is it not? Lord, teach me what to do. Show me what to do. Uh, as I start my day, show me what I need to do. What a good reminder. Um, I love that David must have been a worship leader, must have been that kind of guy, because it says, I, I wrote this psalm for the choir master. This is another one of those that was meant to be sung by the entire congregation, and it is supposed to be arranged with the flutes. I love how, how detailed it is here. And he says, okay, not to micromanage you guys, but bring in a little more flute, okay? A little more cowbell, if you will. And it's sort of this idea that David is giving specific instructions, not just in what to say, but how it should be sung, the accompaniment. Why, why would that be important? Like, why, why on earth would that be important? Um, but to David it was. It was critical that this be sung in a certain way, perhaps in a certain manner, um, and at certain times. But uh, I just think the, the structure of the psalm is so, so, so important for us. And maybe, maybe as we read through some of these psalms, maybe other songs come to mind. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. You heard that song? I'm not going to sing it. It's painful for you. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a familiar song, those first three, ver- first three verses there. Um, it's an older song. Um, but these songs were meant to stick in the heads of the people. But remember that some of these verses that we're going to read, you would not write in a song. Like, the, you hate the wicked people. Like, we don't sing that on Sunday mornings very often. And yet it's part of this, but I think it's important that we understand why are these truths meant to be reminded to a whole group of people gathered together to worship the Lord. And uh, and so this is instruction through singing for the people. During the Reformation, there was, you know, five, six hundred years ago, there was the bulk of the people could not read Latin. They could not, uh, well, they couldn't read, period. And so they were tasked with this idea that unless the priest or the pope preaches, they can't hear. And so Martin Luther endeavored, first of all, to get the Bible translated into the common tongue, into German. Or some, some of you German people would be, well, that's what God speaks to. <laughs> it's not true. Um, but get it into the, the common tongue. But his second task was to write a hymnal. And the writing of the hymnal was so that they could recite the truths of God and remember them in song. It is, it is a biblical thing that we, we remember music well. And so I think this is, a, this is important that we grasp. Let's pray, and then we're going to read the psalm, and we're going to unpack it. Today. Lord, we thank you for a new morning. We look at this the first day of the week. And so in a sense, this is the morning of a new week. And so we want to we request that you would speak to us this morning, that, that uh, our praise would be informed by a psalm like this, that as we read it together, as we preach from it, Father, uh, Lord, would you just speak right to us? We need you to intervene in our lives. We need you to show us the way of righteousness. We need you to sustain us when we're discouraged, when everything around us seems to be pointing towards things that you do not like. It's easy for us to get distracted, God. So, So help us today. Help us just to be able to shut off all those distractions so that we can focus on you and come to know what you would have for us. We thank you for David, for his life, and for uh, speaking to his heart in such a way that he would want to share this with us. And we want to join with the the choir here, together here, but a choir throughout the ages that has heard, sung, and recited this song. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Again, we're not given any circumstances around this, like like Psalm 3 that says this is when David was free, fleeing from Absalom. Could be the same time, we don't know. What we do know of David, though, is that David did not have an easy life. He was uh, constantly pursued. He was constantly in trouble. There was people that uh, that were pursuing him and, and speaking bad of him. 
some of the things that David goes through are certainly self-inflicted. And so we can look at it and say, well, he gets what he deserves. And last Psalm, Psalm, five, Psalm 4 was a good reminder that we don't come when everything is good and right. And even when we've made all the right choices, we sometimes need to come in the midst of our self-inflicted mistakes and the mess that we've made of our own lives. And so we need to come before God. Last week, we were instructed in the first verses just to pray. And that's all it says. You need to pray and lift each request to God. This Today, as we come to Psalm 5, I think we're given a little more instruction on in how we should pray. So let's read it. They're going to use some what we call parallelism. It's going to make repeated statements about the same thing. And we're going to see three of those here. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groanings. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and I watch. Anyone's translation sounds way different than this one? We'll confront that in a second. That's the trouble with the Psalms is they sound so different. And if you sung it in a song or you memorized the King James, it doesn't sound the same. So just bear with me. We're going to stick with ESV because that's the right translation. No, just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. I'll, I'll explain the differences in a minute. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. This is a sung to a congregation. The whole congregation sing this. So sing it with me, people. You do not delight in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful should not stand before your eyes. You shall not, or sorry, you hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the, in, the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down towards this holy temple in the fear of the Lord. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. For there's no, uh, there's no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsel. Because of their abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. And spread your protection over them, so that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord, and you cover him with favor as with a shield. Now, we could sing the last two verses. Easy. We could sing the first three verses. Easy. But these middle ones are a challenge. Let's, let's just unpack the first little bit here. Uh, we get this parallelism. Give ear, consider, pay attention. There's three pleas to God, basically just saying, listen. Listen to what I'm saying. Please, God. And so, it doesn't just say words, though. Don't just hear my words. Hear also my groanings. Haven't anyone been there? I'm not sure how to pray. Ugh. He, just hear me groan. I, I'm not even sure what to do anymore. Consider my groanings. Con, so ponder it. Think, think about what I'm going through, God, as though he doesn't already know. Consider my groanings. Pay attention to the sound of my cry. So there, this is an honest plea. Um, and I think this is important that we grasp. It's Sometimes it's not just your words. And I want to be... I want to be clear that the words that you pray, if you don't get the words right, doesn't mean God won't hear you. Sometimes God just needs to consider the, 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 in, the inner man, the groaning, the heart cry, the, just the burden that you're bearing. So it, it's a plea from David, just see my genuine, my true heart. Just please just, just, God, hear what I'm going through. And then he says this right at the end, um, or, sorry, in verse 1, it says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Who he's praying to is important. O Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to my cry, my King and my God. So there's a reference both to him as Lord, King, and God. And then he says, For to you do I pray. How many people want to say, duh? Right? Well, of course that's who you're praying to. I want to just, I'm guilty of this too. All of us are, probably at times, of forgetting who, we, who we're praying to, first of all. Sometimes we think of God as small. Sometimes we, we forget who he really is and who we're, we're praying to. He's a very holy God. He's a big God. He's an eternal God. He sees everything. He knows everything and can do all things. And so this is the God that we pray to. M more than that, sometimes I think we pray to people. 
I know we don't willfully do that, but sometimes I, I prayed this way and I've heard other people pray. They're actually praying an, an instruction to you. They're not actually talking to God, they're talking to you. And I've heard people, well, let's I, I want to pray for you, and basically they're just sharing a request to each other. They're not I don't I don't know that consciously we're even praying to God. And and so it sounds a little bit silly, but sometimes we have to just check ourselves and make sure our requests are going to the to the source of, or the one that we're crying out to. Be careful that we're not just praying to each other. Um, and enough. Let's keep going. So make sure we're praying to the Lord, and that there's instruction there. Then, verse 3. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. I direct my prayers, or I direct my requests to you, you might read in yours, or I lay my requests before you, if you have a different translation. Uh, the word here... Uh, direct my prayer or lay my request before you or I offer a sacrifice. The Hebrew word is the same word that's used for to prepare the wood and the sacrifice on the altar for the Lord. So just think of it that way. So that's why the confusion in different translations here a little bit. It's the same word and, and I think there's something to be said for how you structure your prayer. Pay attention to how you're laying out your prayers. It's not just throwing out flippant words. It's, you know, take heed of your words. Make sure that you pray. And I, we're, we're going through a, men's, uh, a bit of a men's study called Every Man a Warrior. It gives this idea of prayer as war. So worship, admit, and request. And it gives this little structure to remind us that sometimes in our prayers we need to just stop and, and worship God for who he is. Then as we do so, I think it's really important that we understand who we are in light of who God is. And we're going to see that later in this song. So in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is brought into the presence of God, and the first thing he realizes is his unholiness. And so he comes and he admits his sins before the Lord, and then he makes his request known to God. So sometimes we need to do war and prayer, worship, admit your sin, your own error, your guilt, as, as you come into the presence of God. And then as you do so, then lay your request before the Lord. Order them well. Make sure that you don't come with a bitter, bound-up heart. Order your prayers well. Lay them out in an orderly fashion. But he says this, in the morning. Lord, in the morning. There's an an anticipation of something that's going to happen, not something that has happened. In the morning, this is what I'm going to do. There's this idea that when you go to bed at night, you anticipate that you're going to wake up in the morning and this is the way you're going to start your day. So there's there's a dedication to it. There's there's some discipline that's wrapped up in praying this way. Um... And, and I think it specifically chooses the morning on purpose um, because it's, it's the way to begin. And so to get up that way and anticipate that way means something you prepare for. Um, sometimes we have a hard time being productive in the morning because we didn't go to bed early enough at night. Anyone say amen to that one? I'm guilty of that. And so sometimes the discipline isn't for the morning. The discipline is for the day before to ensure that the, what you're preparing and anticipating doing the next morning can be done. Verse 4. Now we're going to take a jump. Again, we see some of this parallelism. It's going to repeat in in different words. It's going to have the same idea. Well, what about about God? How does God feel about people? And so this is a congregational song. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Why would the congregation need to be reminded of that? Come just as you are to worship. Yeah? Who sung that one before? Is it true? Kinda. That's the right answer. Vague obscurity. Perfect. How is it kinda right? Yes, of course. Should you come however you feel like? No. That is a big no. God does not delight in wickedness. So don't think, don't come lightly thinking that God doesn't care how you live. God does care how you live. I want to take you to a psalm just before we read the rest of these. Psalm 66. Psalm 66. I want to be very careful here not to say that you need to clean your life in order to come before God. We're going to, I'm going to clear that up in just a little bit, but your sin matters. So don't, don't just try to approach God. Remember Isaiah? 
When he comes into the presence of God, he says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. The way I have been speaking, the things that are coming out of my mouth, I, I do not belong here in the presence of God. And so his sin is confronted quickly. Psalm 66, verse 17. I should have been there. I don't know why I told you to go and I didn't go. 66 or 17. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. And if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. But I, uh, but truly, God has listened. He has uh, attended to the voice of my, my groaning or my cry, my prayer. So he says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, this is this idea that if I want to love my sin, but I want to love God. God says, why would I listen to you? You really haven't chosen who to, who you want to serve yet. Joshua has a similar call. Choose this day who you're going to serve. Don't try to play both sides. He says, don't cherish and love your sin and want to cling to your sin, and then God spare me from all the consequences of it. So when we think of David writing something like this, if I had continued to love the sin and everything else and was unrepentant and, and didn't ask for forgiveness. But when I realized the depth of my sin, when I confessed that to the Lord and I found forgiveness for that, then I, can, then I can cry out to God with, this, with a degree of freedom. God does not delight in wickedness. Let's go back to Psalm 5 and then we'll read the rest. God does not delight in wickedness and evil may not dwell with you. Uh, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes and you hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the blood first, bloodthirsty and deceitful man. So you're left to ask, what hope do we have, correct? Because we, we should, if we're honest, recognize that all of us fall into those categories. How many of you are a good person? You can approach God on your own. No one's going to raise your hand. Well, I hope you don't. If you do raise your hand, we'll talk after. Um, we have more Bible to go through. But David is actually making something really clear to the congregation I want you to know God does not want you to come on your own. So let's, let's go jump to the next one. We can't come to God however we feel like it. We must come. But I, how does he want to come? How should he come before the Lord? Verse 7. First, before that. Through the abundance of his steadfast love. I'm not going to come because I'm a good person. I'm going to come before you because of the steadfast love that you have. So we, are, we enter into this relationship not on our own merits, but through his mercy and through his grace. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. So we should come before him because we know and, uh, and because, because of what Christ has done for us. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. And I, I love the end of verse 7, in the fear of you. Just It takes me right back to that passage in Isaiah. Fear is a right understanding of who God is and a right understanding of who we are, which translates into a change so that we be more like who he is. So if the fear of God is a powerful picture of, of who God is. Now God is merciful, compassionate, loving, yes, but he's also fully holy and just and righteous and does not let evil into his presence. And so for, for us to come into his presence, there's, this is a good reminder for us as church. I think it's a great reminder, maybe a, an introductory song that should be sung with flutes. That would be my insight. Um, but this song should be sung as we, we begin a service. Make sure you've taken stock of your life. As we approach God, remember who we're approaching. He is a holy God. But he has provided his son to deal with your sinfulness. And so we come to him through the abundance of his steadfast, enduring, sustaining love. And so we come, that, that should inform the worship, correct? Any, anyone a little bit thankful for that? You have no business being there apart from what he's done for us. So, verse 8. So, Lord, uh, because I want to come before you, this is David's heart now, I want to dwell with you, but without you I can't dwell with you. It was already told, the, the evil will not dwell with him. God hates, God destroys, God fights against those who continue to do evil, who love and cherish their sin, and so on. God fights against them. So if I want to dwell with you, Lord, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies, meaning that everyone else around me wants to take me, take me down. 
So lead me in the right way. Make your way straight before me. Make, make it plain to me what I need to do, God. This is the cry of David here. Um, and I think it's important for us too. Now verse 9. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their, with their tongue. Uh, make them bear the guilt, o God, their own guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out. For they have rebelled against you. David reminds the congregation, sing this people. I want you to understand that what, the pe- what, what people who speak falsely are like and what their end is going to be. Um, m- meaning that we're going to, does anyone feel like we have a lot of voices in our head? We have God's voice over here. We read the Bible. We, we talk to s- other Christians and they're encouraging us to do this. And then I go to work and, and I go home and I watch TV and it's telling me to do this. And I just don't know what to believe anymore. I don't know what to do. And so I'm left to consider, I'm left trying to worry what am, what's right. What am I supposed to do? And so David reminds the congregation of the outcome of the way of life of someone who is evil. And so the outcome, let's, let's read them, verse 9. There is no truth in their mouth. Deceit, okay? So their inmost self is destruction. What is the end result of lying? Destruction. It leads to a bad, bad end. So it's going to bring us to the end of each one of these things. Their throat is an open grave, meaning that their words are dead. So they flatter with their mouth or their tongue, meaning that they speak really good things. Oh, you believe in yourself. You're, you're, you're powerful. You're strong. You're a good person. Just follow your heart. Right, Glenda? Just follow your heart. And you would think, yeah, yeah, I am a pretty good person. And they flatter you with their lips, but it's an open grave. It leads to destruction. And so it, an open grave, meaning it's just, it's dead. There's no life in their words. And so just, uh, just understand what flattery does. might puff you up. This is the whole realm of self-help. Puff you up to such a point, but then you realize, I really can't help myself. I can't help myself. And so just uh, be careful of flattery. Verse 14. Make them bear their own guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsel. Meaning, bring them to the end Bring them to the end of their own advice, their own direction. Bring, bring them to the end of it so that we can see what the result will be. Um, basically, let them bear their own guilt, meaning that when, they're, when they have their actions, let them bear the consequences of their actions. Now, this seems like a strange thing to pray, but I think it's very... In contrast, we recognize that Christ has come to bear our guilt. And so we, we come actually appealing to mercy rather than fairness. We talked about this in the past. How many of you would want a fair God? No. We do want a just God. We do want a just God, but a fair God would give us what we deserve and not what we don't deserve. And what we don't deserve is mercy and grace. And so if, if we are left unto ourselves and we want to continue in this path of what the wicked do and trying to rebel and push God out, instead of submitting to God more and more and calling out to God for mercy and help and times of trouble, what a good way to start the morning. God, let me see. Let me see the end result of, of people's lives that are living this way. I want to avoid that. I want to avoid destruction. I don't want to be a liar. I, wa- I want to avoid flattery. I don't, I don't really care what other people say. I want you to, I want to know the truth about myself. God, show me, show me what it is, the, the consequences of my sin before I do it. I had a pastor friend of mine do that for me very early on. And he said, Sean, I want you to count the cost. If you fail morally, what will this cost you? What will it cost your church? What will it cost your children? What will it cost your wife? And he said, I want you to write it down. Wh- what would that life be like? Man, that was, that was sobering. No, you know, when... The result of your actions affect the lives of other people. So bear that guilt. It it helps us to avoid it. It helps us to avoid and take very seriously what we're being called to. And fall by their own counsel, so give good counsel. Um, Make sure that you're unguarding my own words uh, towards other people. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out. For David wanting to be in God's presence, um, recognizing that continuing in sin would, would actually put him out. And he wanted people, other people to come and worship as well, but wanted them to avoid this sin. 
for they have rebelled against you. They're getting exactly what they want. They don't want to be around you. They don't want to listen to you. They don't want to submit to you. Give them what they want. They want to rebel? Let them rebel, but let them come to the end of themselves. Now verse 11. But, here's the contract. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Here's your permission. It, it, this is permission. It's not, just, it's not an instruction. So this is an instruction to the congregation or permission for the congregation. Rejoice, people. You have permission to do it. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm about to say something. Should I say something? No, should I be happy about this? I'm not sure if I should be happy about this. I'm saying you have permission to, to rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them so that, or that, those who love your name may exalt in you. Charles Spurgeon, I didn't write it down, I wish I would have, but let me sum it up for you in my own words. Charles Spurgeon said this about this verse. He said, the blasphemous are more free to say their words than the righteous are to rejoice. How many people swear a lot louder than we rejoice? So maybe we should turn the tables a little bit, correct? That's what Spurgeon is saying. Here's your permission, people, church. Rejoice. You have the right to rejoice. So this is, I think this is the first song in a, in a congregation, uh, when the congregation comes together to sing, now is your permission to rejoice. So let's rejoice together. Um, because um, God has spread his protection over us. He's cared for us. He's provided in this abundant, abundant love. And so we should have the freedom, the right, the privilege to rejoice, not just here, but elsewhere too. Why should anyone have the right to shut us up? We let people swear at work. Why can't we talk about Jesus? So wh why, why don't we? And somehow we've been muzzled, as, as Christian people, we've been muzzled in our rejoicing. But let your rejoicing and your exaltation and your magnification of who God is be done with tact, with grace, with compassion, full of grace and seasoned with salt. It should make people hungry for the Lord, not be obnoxious. And so we, we do this in worship to the Lord. We sing our songs, we also speak about it. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor. That's grace, divine favor, something that comes right from God. James says, for every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Everything good comes from the Lord. This is the favor that he's speaking out as with a shield. Let's go to the book of Ephesians and just talk about that for a second. What is the shield? Ephesians chapter 6. We know in, in the, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he says, I want you to take on the shield of faith. Okay, this, but the writer of Psalms is saying, we have this thing to shield us, this favor of God that shields us. So the shield of faith is supposed to do something unique. Uh, Paul says in 6 verse 16, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Or on top of these things, all the other armor, you put all the other armor on, then take up the shield of faith. Because what's going to be thrown at you is all sorts of accusations, all sorts of temptations, all sorts of images and thoughts and bad advice and bad counsel and all these different things that, God, that he's trying to make clear in this psalm. He's saying... You're going to be surrounded by this. I hope that you see the end result of that counsel. I hope that you see the end result of that action. I hope you see the end result of that way of life. I hope you see the end result of what lying does. When you see that, avoid it. Don't do it. Don't go after it. So the shield of faith is this, that it protects us from all these temptations, all these accusations, and all the things that get thrown at you that are lies. They tell you that you're worthless. They tell you that God doesn't care about you. God's forgotten. He doesn't, he can't answer prayer. He won't answer prayer. And he, all the evil one wants to throw at you. How does faith combat that? Well, Paul is making this really clear that you need to take it up and say, this is the shield of faith. Faith would be to make a claim or to proclaim who God is and what God has done to protect you from the from the enemy's attacks, which are always false. But he is the father of lies. So he's going to throw all sorts of lies at you, 
and say, you should give in to this. This, this is going to feel really good. God won't see. God won't care. This is just, you deserve this. And so you fall. Fall to temptation. And the first thing he turns around and says, how could you? You're worthless. God could never love you. He won't forgive you for that. You did that in outright rebellion. You knew it was wrong. And you did it anyway. He's not going to forgive you for that. And so the shield of faith would be this. You know, Christ does love you. He knows you and he knows your inmost being. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of sins. And not just to leave us forgiven, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he, he knows what you, what you do. He knows your heart. He knows how many hairs are on your head, Carl. He cares about you. And he does know your prayers even before you ask them, but he wants you to call on him. And so we have psalm after psalm, verse after verse, truth after truth, that as we put our faith and we rest in confidently in that, we can extinguish all the lies that the enemy throws. It's a good thing when we worship, is it not? So when we start a morning in worship, confession of sin, and then making a request to God, that starts us in a pretty good place for the day. Because we know, yes, I have sinned, but I've been forgiven. I, I know who the God that I serve, that he's going to carry me through, and he's going to make my way straight, and I'm going to worship him throughout this day. I'm going to talk to other people about him. I'm going to tell other people about him. I'm going to say his name. I'm going to rejoice at some point today for, for who he is and what he's done. Make sure that your worship is informed by the scriptures, and it will get sweeter and sweeter every day. This is a good reminder for us in the morning, maybe the beginning of a week. Maybe it's a good reason for you to get up in the morning and get in your Bible and pray to the Lord. Amen? We're going to take, uh, take communion here. So I'm going I'm to pray and then we'll ask our guys to come up. What a great way to, to celebrate and to remember a God who has loved us while we were still sinners. And that should be evidence to us that, that we are protected and cared for. God, we've probably taken this bread and this cup a lot of times in our life. We've seen it. We've done it probably with probably with a, not a right heart during this time. So we pray that this morning, God, that you would just speak to my heart and speak to all of our hearts. God, just to convict us of sin that we need to address before we come to the table. Convict us of the relationships that we've damaged. We may need to make right. But we thank you for the, the truth that is wrapped up in this table as well. I thank you for the both the body and blood that you would give on our behalf because we are not perfect people. You call us as, as sinners to this table to find covenant in your blood. Thank you for your provision of that. We, we appeal now to your abundant love, not to our ability to do everything right, but to your grace and to your love. And we don't want to we don't want to trample on that by taking this cup in an unworthy way. So help us to be sober in our thinking. Help us to take it both with gratitude and humility and in fear. And in that fear that you would cause us to walk wisely because of it. Lord, we, we need you to continue to work in us. Give us the courage to rejoice. Give us the freedom in our own lives to rejoice. And so, God, would you just speak, speak into, our, into our hearts today, even as we go home.